If we haven't met before, my name is Boaz, and I'm the worship pastor here at One Hope Baptist, and it's, it's a wonderful night to be here because tonight is a special night where we finished um, a three-month series that we've been journeying through together called Rediscovering Jesus, looking at the life and ministry of Jesus in the Gospels of Matthew and Mark. But I thought it'd be great before we get stuck in to just have a quick show of hands how many of you are grateful for our senior pastor, Matt Jacoby, in, in the, for the way that he's condensed this series into just three months? A quick show of hands. How many of you, that's amazing. So many hands. How many of you wish that there were more weeks in this series? A quick show of hands. A few of you. Wonderful. Now, how many of you didn't even know we were in the series? Hands up. No, no, put your hands down. Well, whether you like it or not, today is the end of this three-month series. And, you know, when I heard that we're going through this gospel of Matthew, I'm, I, I recall the time when I went to um, my preaching class some time ago, and there was a fellow student there with me, and he was pastoring his own church at the time. And he shared with the class about how when he went through the gospel of Matthew with his church, it took him all of three years to finish so whether you like it or not, today is the end of this three-month series together in this, um, through the, the, the gospel of Matthew and Mark. And I have the privilege of looking with you at the final chapter in the gospel of Matthew. Uh, more specifically, we're going to be looking at the final few verses in this gospel. And in this... In this chapter, let's just take a moment now to just take a step back and look at the context to see what's just happened here. In the previous chapter, in, in Matthew chapter 27, Jesus had just been crucified, death on the cross, been raised to life again. And then we come to this chapter in chapter 28. And if we had time, we would dig into the events that took place around Jesus' crucifixion. But because of time, we, we, we can't dive in into the details of how we can be certain that the events that took place around Jesus' crucifixion is reliable. It's, it's something that you can put your faith and trust in. But if you want to dig a little bit deeper, let, let me quickly recommend this book. It's a book written by a Christian apologist. Um, his name is J. Warner Wallace, and he, he wrote this book called Cold Case Christianity. And J. Uh, Warner Wallace is also a homicide detective. And so when he takes the four gospel accounts of Jesus' life here on earth, he examines them through the, the lens of a homicide detective to see whether these accounts can really be trusted or not. It's a great read. If you've never read it before, definitely go and read this book, Cold Case Christianity. But let's say all that is true. Let's presume that the, the events around Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, that all that is true. The question now is, so what? What does it have to do with you? What does it have to do with me? What do we do? Well, Jesus makes it very clear in these final few verses in Matthew chapter 28. In fact, these last few verses have become known as the Great Commission. Let's have a look at these few verses, these three verses that Jesus spells out for us, this great commission. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. For surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The great commission that Jesus gives us. And even though it might be three verses long, it's actually three verses of jam-packed detail that we can really spend so much time unpacking. But let's just start with this first verse, in verse 18. Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. All authority. Or in other words, Universal authority. Universal 
kingship. Because Jesus has has risen from the grave. He's conquered death. He's now been enthroned as king by the Father in heaven. And as the universal king, he's telling his disciples, go and tell, tell the world that I am now the king. And if anyone would want to come and be part of my kingdom, let them come. Make these disciples so that they can be part of this kingdom. But if you want to be part of my kingdom, he says, Realize that there are certain expectations, certain requirements in the way that you are to live if you choose to be part of my kingdom. It's just like when we live here in Australia, isn't it? There are certain expectations, certain rules that we have to abide to. For example, you, you don't have the liberty to drive on whichever side of the road you choose. We, we don't have the freedom to steal from one another, do we? It's... These are the expectations if you choose to live here in Australia. You don't have to live here. You can certainly live anywhere else, but if you choose to live here, there are certain expectations, certain rules that we need to live by. And so that's what Jesus is saying here. If people are willing to be part of my kingdom as the, as the ultimate universal king, let them come. But there's certain expectations in the way that they must live. If they choose to be kingdom people, they must be my disciples. They must live as I did, to walk as I walk. Because one day, Jesus will come back. And when he comes back, he's going to come and ask you, what are you doing in my kingdom if you're not my disciple? And so it's with this context in mind, we have the great commission. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And you make them disciples by baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Again, there's so much in these three verses alone. But in our time together, let me just highlight two things, two really simple things, more specifically, two things about discipleship. The first one is this, God looks for disciples, not converts. In verse 19, Jesus says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. He didn't say go and make converts of all nations. He didn't even say, go and make Christians of all nations. No, Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations. And realize there's a difference here. Because Jesus is saying, he's not just looking for someone who will say, I'm a Christian, and that's it. He's not saying that I'm just looking for someone who will confess that I'm Lord, that I'm God. Because did you know that even the demons say that? In Luke chapter 4, verse 40, it says, at sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sicknesses, and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people shouting, you are the son of God. There it is. But Jesus rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Messiah. So what that you know that he is God? So what if you call yourself a Christian? So what if you know that he is the one that the scripture told was to come to save us? Even the demons knew that. No, God is looking for more than people who would be converts, people who would confess that he is Lord. Jesus, God is looking for disciples, people who would follow him that will live as Jesus lived, who would obey as Jesus obeyed. You know, one of my favorite Chinese action films is this film called Ip Man. It's an incredible film. If you've never seen it before, you haven't truly lived yet. Go and watch it, Ip Man. It's this show that stars Hong Kong Chinese actor Donnie Yen, incredible actor. 
full of combat and, and, and all that. But in this story, Itman, it follows the, the true events of a, a guy who actually lived, this Chinese martial arts master. His name was Yip Man. The show is called Ip Man. His name is Yip Man. I know it's confusing. Just bear with me for a moment. This story, Yip Man, this is a series of four different films that, that follow that follows this guy called Yip Man. And Yip Man practiced a form of martial arts called Wing Chun. All right, hang, hang, hang in there. I know. It, it's, it, he practiced this form called Wing Chun. And this, these four films depict some incredible Wing Chun combat and the, the, the storytelling just tugs your heart. It, it, this, because this, the life of this Chinese martial arts master, Yip Man, he's just a man of great values and integrity, and he, he comes up and battles all sorts of opponents. Some of them were really, really strong, but you know, in the end, he always wins. Yip Man was a man that people loved, people respected, people adored, so much so that they, they, they would flock to him, and some would even go to him and beg him, please teach us, because we want to be just like you. Yip Man. And he would take them. He would teach them as as, his, as, his teach, as, as their, their teacher, and they will become his disciples. He'll teach them, you know, move like this. You now, if you're going to use techniques of, of the Wing Chun style, you need to, to, to block like that. Use that wooden pole, that wooden stand you saw earlier in that, that post to, to, to practice your moves. Move your leg in this way. He's saying, do as I do. Follow my instructions. And so people will know that you are part of this Wing Chun family. And one of these students that Yip Man actually taught was none other, none other than the great Bruce Lee, who would break into Hollywood. But imagine for a moment that Bruce Lee, or just any one of his disciples, imagine if they refused to listen to Yip Man, refused to train and to move and to, to, to heed his instructions, Oh, yes, they'll, they'll be there in, in the midst of everybody. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll watch, they observe, they see, oh, okay, you, you move a bit like that. Oh, th you practice on that. Yeah, I can see. Oh, yes, Yip Man, he, he is my master. Yes, he is. I'm, I'm defi he's definitely my master. But you know as well as I do, the moment they move to try to imitate Yip Man, you know that they are not part of the Wing Chun family. And the same is true of being a disciple of Jesus. Oh yes, you can come to church. You can sit in our midst. You can be found in life groups. You can be, you can be going to Alpha and doing all the things that we do. You can call Jesus as Lord. Jesus is the Son of God. Certainly I believe and I know He is the Messiah. But you know as well as I do, that right here in your heart, in the way that you live, what goes through your mind, what is in your hands, you know that you are really not a disciple of Jesus. That's why Jesus goes on to add in verse 20. He says, teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. He didn't say go and teach them to recite everything I've commanded you. He, he didn't say go and teach them to explain every theological concept you can come up with. No, Jesus says teach them to obey, to live it out, to follow everything I have commanded you. So what if you know that Jesus is Lord? So what if you know that he's the Messiah, the Son of God? If you call yourself a Christian, it's not enough that you know that you should Love your neighbor as yourself. And yet when it comes to it, you stand idly by. So what if you call yourself a Christian? It's not enough if you know that you should worship him with all that you have in the way that you adore him. In the congregation of the righteous, of the people who will call themselves the body of Christ. And yet your hands are in your pocket and your mind is thinking about what you're going to have for dinner or whether you texted that person or not, or whether the music has moved you, 
or the song isn't quite the one you like, or the singer, or the sound levels isn't the way you like it. So what? If you know that he is God, and yet you don't live it out, Jesus is saying, it's your life. It's your heart. And one day he will come back unexpectedly and the doors of heaven will shut and there will be those like in Mark, in Matthew chapter 25, verse 11, who will say, Lord, Lord, open the door to us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you because you are not my disciple. Therefore, keep watch because you don't know the day or the hour. Today is the day, church. Today is the day to be Jesus' disciples. Not tomorrow, not, not, not next week, not later on. Today, because we don't know when he'll return, but he will return like a thief in the night. But hear me, church, I know that discipleship is not easy. I know that. I'm sure the disciples of Yip Man didn't think it was easy as well to move and to train and to heed Yip Man's instructions. No, it takes sacrifice, yes. It takes determination. It takes resolve. And dare I say it, it takes discipline. Which is why it's so important that you know why you do what you do as Jesus' disciple. And perhaps more importantly, who you call your master. Which leads us to our second point, which is discipleship is never about you. Let that sink in for a moment. Discipleship is never about you. Jesus says in verse 19 of the Great Commission, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The mark of a disciple is someone who has been baptized. What's baptism anyway? Well, we can really spend the entire evening just unpacking what baptism is all about. But in brief, baptism is a public declaration of repentance. Listen to what the apostle Peter says in the book of Acts. Here he's just preached the gospel, the good news that Jesus has died for your sin. And he says in Acts 2 verse 38, repent and be baptized. There's that connection there. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Baptism is a public declaration of repentance, knowing that the way that you've lived your life without Christ was leading you down places of hopelessness, of death, of of just despair. And you know that the way that you live, the way if you continue down this road, it's not going to end well. But when you repent, And when you see what Jesus did on the cross, you set aside, you turn away from that old lifestyle and say, Jesus, I take up the forgiveness of my sins through you and what you did on the cross. And I live for you and I follow you, turning away from that to live for him. Because remember, discipleship is never about you. Discipleship is all about pleasing your master, pleasing the Lord. And I know for some of us, there's some really big struggles in our lives. And you know what they are. They may be some addictions that you're facing, or the pride in your heart, or your doubts, your wants, your questions, And frankly, sometimes we just don't know the answers to some of these questions. But whatever they are, we do know that in the palm of our hands, or in our cases for many of us today, in your your phone, we have the Word of God 
We have the Bible that tells us exactly what we need to do to please our master, to please the Lord. And we know that that means that we put him first. We know it means just, it means putting to death our old self, all our wants, our desires, and our, and our doubts and our questions, to put that aside, to follow him. It does mean sacrifice. But the question for you, church, is will you do it? Will you do what you need to do to please your master? Years ago, when I was working in an engineering workshop, there was a church in Melbourne that, that offered this opportunity to become their youth pastor. This was years and years ago before, before One Hope, but the church they had offered to, to pay for uh, my studies in, in the Melbourne School of Theology, they, they put on the table, paid, um, uh, provided accommodation and an allowance for Sue Ann and I to, to go. All we had to do was to pack up and move to Melbourne and take up this role there as the youth pastor. And quite frankly, it was, it was enticing because the job that I was in at the time, work, it, it had become unsettling and the church we attended at the time was also, it had a few issues and we didn't have any kids. So this proposal was, was quite exciting. And so we went up, we paid the church a couple of visits. But after the second visit, it was painful to realize that this exciting new possibility just wasn't right. There was no great sense of peace about it all. There wasn't any sort of certainty about it. And it just didn't seem like God was leading us there. And truth be told, it was something that I probably wanted more than what God wanted for me. And so, heavily, I picked up that phone and I rang the pastor to reject the, off the offer, knowing full well that it meant further suffering in where we were at in life. But you know, from that day, I said to the Lord, God, you know exactly where I'm at. And you know what the future holds for us. And I'm going to trust you. And I'm going to rely on you. Because I live to please you, God. Fast forward to today. And we can look back and we can see that God has led us every step of the way to where we are now. And can I say, church, it's such an honor and privilege to be a part of One Hope Baptist Church to do what I do here. But I know that it's never about me and it never will ever be about me because I know I am a servant of the Most High. I'm a disciple of Jesus here to do His work, to do His will. And I have the privilege to, do, to play a small role in this grand plan and design that God had already designed from way back before the creation of all things that I get to play this small part and you know, I love the thought that I have the privilege to bring him glory in whatever it is he wants me to do. Because I know discipleship is never about me. It's always about him, pleasing him, fulfilling his purposes, accomplishing his desires. Because that's what discipleship is all about. And I sense that for some of us here today, we need to hear that again. That if you call yourself a disciple of Jesus, if you call yourself a Christian, ask yourself this question. Do you please him with your life? Do you please him with the, with the lifestyle that you're living right now? What about your thoughts? What about your priorities? Even when Jesus came to earth all those years ago, he came to please his Father in heaven. How much more us, his disciples. So what can we do? What are some things we can do to put this into practice? Well, Jesus tells us very clearly to go. 
Go and make disciples of all nations. And yes, I know, it's, it's a lot, even right there, to just go and make disciples. So let me just offer two quick thoughts for you. Two quick things that we can really put into practice involving what we need to go and do. The first one is this, go and be baptized. If you are a Christian today, a disciple of Jesus, and you haven't been baptized, my question for you is, why not? What are you waiting for? What's holding you back? Jesus tells us, and Peter, the, the apostle Peter reminds us that baptism is this public declaration to tell the whole world that you are a disciple of Jesus, that you're turning away from what you want, the life you once lived to follow him, to please him. And if you need more information on how you can, uh, what baptism is all about, there are pastors available even tonight to have a chat with you. If you want to fill out the connect card, do that as well. They're out in the foyer or even online. Jump online, fill out the connect card. Let us know that you want to get baptized and that you need more information. We'd we'll love to have a chat with you. But whatever it is, if you are a disciple of Jesus, let the world know that you're putting aside what you, the life you once lived to please him. Because Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32, he says, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. So go, church. Go and be baptized. And the second thing we can do, and I think this is going to be a little bit heavy for some of us to hear, but some of what, a second thing we, we need to do as disciples of Jesus is to go and be inconvenienced. Now, hold on. I know that this, this means a lot and it can be taken the wrong way. So please hear what I have to say. Hear my heart in this. I'm not saying that we need to be silly about being inconvenienced. I'm, I'm not saying that if you're going to drive to Melbourne that you need to to be a disciple of Jesus, you need to detour through Warnable in order to get there. I'm not saying that if you're gonna, if you're gonna feed your hungry tummy that you need to, to feed every hungry soul that you have in your life. No, please don't misunderstand the heart behind what I'm saying here. What I'm saying here is that if you call yourself a disciple of Jesus, we need to start with this mindset that we're willing and ready to be inconvenienced for our master, for our Lord. And for some of us, that might mean being inconvenienced right after this service by going out and speaking to new people tonight. For some of us, as a disciple of Jesus, being inconvenienced means opening your Bibles every day to read it for even just two minutes. Being inconvenienced, a disciple of Jesus might mean inviting someone to Alpha. Or take it one step further, taking someone to Alpha and at attending it with them. Or perhaps being inconvenienced means picking up your phone sometime during the week to call that person that God has put in your heart to ring and ask them, I've been thinking about you. How are you doing? Or perhaps some of us, being inconvenienced means putting down that screen to help our struggling child or our friend or loved one. Before we can go and make disciples of all nations, we first must be disciples ourselves who are willing to be inconvenienced for our Lord God. So go, church. Go and be baptized. And go and be inconvenienced as a disciple of Jesus. Let me close with this story. It's a story that was written by a Chinese pastor some time ago. He wrote, when God spoke to Sister Chang, a house church leader from Henan, China, he told her to go and do something that made no earthly sense at all. He told her to go and preach the gospel on the steps outside the local police station. 
Such an action in communist China is a sure way to invite severe punishment. But the more Sister Chang prayed about it, the more clearly the inner voice of God continued to tell her to do it. Finally, she saw no option at all but to obey God. Standing on the top, outside, the top step outside the police station, she boldly proclaimed the gospel to astonished onlookers. Within a few minutes, several police officers dragged her inside and placed her under arrest. To the human eye, her obedience seems foolish. But God can see things that we can't. Sister Chang was sentenced without a trial and sent to the local women's prison where she was placed alongside thousands of spiritually lost souls. She boldly and lovingly proclaimed the gospel to her fellow prisoners. The light of the gospel spread like wildfire. Within just three months, 800 women believed in, the, in Jesus. The entire atmosphere in the prison changed and new sounds of praise and worship were heard echoing down the prison hallways and in the courtyard. The prison director, he was greatly impressed at the change in the atmosphere and was able to trace it all the way back to the, the preaching of Sister Chang. He brought her into his office and said, you made my job easy. There's no more fighting between the prisoners and the women. They've become gentle and obedient. We need more people like you working here. From today, we have decided to let you go free. But we also want to give you a full-time job here in the prison and we'll pay you 5,000 yen per month. That's about 1,000 Aussie. A, ru a, a, a fortune in rural Henan. He continued, we will also give you a car and your own driver and we'll find you comfortable housing. Sister Chang briefly considered the offer and then replied, 20 years ago, I became a disciple of Jesus and he's been wonderful to me. But I don't believe your offer of a car, driver, and salary is in line with what Jesus wants to do with my life. And I belong to him. All I want to do is preach the good news. God may or may not be calling some of you today to stand at the top of a flight of stairs at your local police station to proclaim the good news. But what he is calling all who would call themselves disciple of Jesus is whether or not you're willing to be inconvenienced for him, whether you're willing to publicly declare that you've, you're turning away from your old way of life to please him. Whatever it is, it's over to you, church. What will you do? Because 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to earth when he left the comforts of heaven to die on the cross for you and for me, for the forgiveness of our sins. And because of that, Jesus has been enthroned above all things in heaven and on earth. And he is the ultimate universal king who will one day return. And when he does, he comes and he looks for his disciples. Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for your word and for Jesus and the life that he lived, that he could die for us on, our, in the, on the cross for our sins. And God, right now, wherever we are, we know that you see us. We know that you know exactly where we are and what goes on in our hearts. And Father, for some of us who call ourselves disciple of Jesus and maybe we've been struggling with following you boldly, obediently. God, I just pray that you stir in us this fire, this hunger, this resolve, this determination to live for you once again. And Lord God, there are some of us here today who have not decided to give our lives to you. God, I just pray even right now that as you call us to yourself, that you reveal to us the truth of who you are and what you did on the cross and even right now, I know you are calling some of us to give our lives to you. 
Church, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if this is you, can I invite you right now to just quickly raise your hand up? If this is you, thank you. Thank you. If you know that Jesus is calling you tonight to receive Him as your Lord and Savior, just raise your hand and just put it back down. And you know right now Jesus is saying, Welcome home, child. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for what you've done on the cross. Lord, we know in your word you said as long as we, we believe in our hearts that Jesus has died on the cross and confess with our mouth that you are Lord, we have been saved. If our brothers and sisters here today who have received you as our Lord, as their Lord and Savior, God, I just thank you so much. And all of heaven is rejoicing right now because of, that, because of the decision that has been made. Father, we give you the praise, we give you the glory. And I pray, Lord God, as we go from here, that you use us mightily in our sphere, in our lives. Father, we pray and we commit ourselves to you as disciples of Jesus. We look forward to the day when you come back. Thank you, God. Make us your disciples, that the world may know that you reign and you live. I thank you, God. We pray all this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people say, Amen. Man, how challenging and encouraging was that message by Pastor Boaz. And, and, you know, he made two points, didn't he? One was to go and be baptized. And we just want to encourage you. Maybe you've been sitting there exploring that, thinking, what does that look like for me? What does that look like to be baptized? Well, we would love to support you in that. And so we just encourage you, get in contact with us, head to our website, onehope.org.au, and uh, we would love to walk with you as you make that faith declaration. And the other response is to be a disciple. And, you know, we can't disciple others if we're not being a disciple ourselves. And so what does that walk? What does that step? And navigating, as Boaz talked about, you know, the, the inf- inconvenience you may find in that. But you know what? Our hope is that as we continue to walk and be a disciple we choose the will of God over our own will and therefore find life well it's been awesome to connect with you and we look forward to seeing you next weekend be blessed